yeah, okay, I will start. You always do that. Perfect. <laughs> um, yes, today we are talking with Shannon, Shannon Hayes, uh, and we. I wanted to connect to you, Shannon, primarily just because I love the title of your blog, The Radical Homemaker. <laughs> uh, anything radical, it, it uh, tickles my brain. So let's start with that. Why did you choose that uh, name? You know, I wish I could say I chose it. Um, I feel like I didn't. Um, it started uh, back when my kids were really little and um, I was homeschooling them and um, I was noticing how, uh, well, I had gotten out of grad school. I had a PhD and I was going on in academia. And when I was looking at the opportunities that were presented to us, it seemed that um, nothing actually financially worked. I started to think that the wool was being pulled over my eyes um, because once I backed out for the cost of having a job and the taxes and the time away, uh, it just didn't seem like it was financially a realistic uh, proposition. And I had grown up on a family farm and um, I, this is in Northern Appalachia and my neighbors had grown up really, you. The, the government would have defined it as poverty, but it was never impoverished feeling at all. Mm. And so uh, that was my primary social life as a teenager. And that was my economic perspective where I started to think, wait a minute, this having a job thing just doesn't add up if I can be close to my food and close to the way I'm living. Yeah. And so I chose to step away from academia. I finished my PhD and then I started uh, asking questions like why why does it seem like everyone believes that we should go on this one path but it economically to me as I'm you know encountering the adult world it it doesn't seem very sensible or pragmatic no. so that led me to start to realize um gaining from the wisdom of my Appalachian elderly neighbors who had grown up in quote unquote poverty um, that it was the homemaking skills that would empower me to go forward with this. But I was raised a hardcore feminist. My mother was, you know, the second wave feminism, and I was raised to pursue a career. And so this looked really strange. Yeah. And um, I was, I started researching it thinking, I'm going to write the most hated book ever. Um, but um, but I, I was really deeply curious. So I wanted to travel and ask these questions and started researching this. And um, all I can say is that for about two years, my brain just spun on this subject nonstop. And it was originally, I was thinking the enlightened homemaker, but that sounded so pompous. And um, yeah. then all of a sudden, um, I was out walking one day and the words radical homemaker just came into my brain and I went home. I was like, well, that came from somewhere. I don't know where it came from. I don't think it was me. I think it was channeled from something, but I, mm -hmm. cause I went home and looked up the term radical and realized it's about getting back to roots and that, you know, it's not radical in terms of, I don't know what we think of as, you know, the fringe behaviors that are on social media or whatever, but it was about getting back to the core and, and questioning what we're being told and returning to not core values per se, but looking at those skills, the core skills that it takes to have a meaningful life. And um, so that's where it came from. Yeah. And wonderful. It, it reminded me uh, of a blog post Cecilia have written called I used to be a feminist. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I come from another part of the of the world, the planet. Yeah. But uh, I was raised in Copenhagen by a feminist mother and she was part of this whole Scandinavian big wave of liberation of women and this whole equal rights thing. And when I became a mother, things just changed and actually my first blog was about this we had a movement in Copenhagen where the feminists I was used to be part of the feminists Copenhagen academic feminist wave but then things changed and these feminists they made a quite harsh attack on women who chose to stay home with their children we have a very good child care in Copenhagen. It's cheap and it's for everyone and it's not hard to get. And 
you can get rid of your children when they're about I don't know, nine months old, then you don't have to look after them anymore because you are a feminist and you want to go to work. And and those women who chose not to were attacked by the feminists. And because they said that women who would stay home, they would make the the other women feel bad. And that would undermine the equal rights movement for women. And I sat with my child on my lap thinking, where's my freedom? What if I want to stay home? The freedom to choose to stay home is gone then. Then as a feminist, I cannot be a homemaker. I cannot be a mother. I have to be a feminist in a particular way and my freedom is lost. So this uh, hate word, which is Danish word, so it wouldn't, wouldn't make sense to you, but there was this word they used for these mothers. I called my blog that word yeah. and started writing because okay. it didn't make sense. Yeah. I, but, but, I'm optimistic that, um, you know, Radical Homemakers is now, uh, well, this is, it'll be its 13th birthday this year. Um, I I feel like the discourse has moved beyond that, but I think it was pushing, it was the pushing back from the other side, like, wait, wait a minute, you know, even Betty Friedan, um, who wrote The Feminine Mystique. Are you familiar with that book? I mean, it was no. very popular here in the United States and she really was responsible for kicking off what we call second wave feminism in this country. Mm-hmm. And uh, in her last um, her last version of the book, she wrote in the foreword that people, this is not a battle of the sexes any longer. No, this exactly. is about corporations and the people. And we need to move beyond this discussion. And I do think, I, I want to believe, I don't, I'm don't. i no longer really in academia and following that discourse at this point, um, but I want to believe that, that um, we've moved beyond um, chewing up each other for our different decisions on this. I know um, I have very good friends who I can't believe how career oriented they are. And yet they have fabulous, happy, health, you know, <laughs> happy and healthy kids. And they love what I do with my kids. And so maybe it's just in my world where I've been able to build that acceptance. I don't know. But I do know that when the book came out, I could not get any interest in Europe um, 13 years ago, I couldn't get them to, I tried so hard. I got, I was able to get a little bit of play for the research and the ideas in Ireland, but maybe it's just different, you know, maybe it was just not the right time because it sounds like maybe the debate is in a different place. I think that's right. I wouldn't be able to, to say, I, I, chose to not follow academia and not I I stopped reading newspapers and I I thought it was can I say ridiculous no yeah absolutely I, I think <laughs> so the whole debate on women's lives and children's lives and I think it 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 there was such a loud voice of this whole getting things under control and controlling the children and make sure they behave and make sure they get the good grades and make sure that you as a mother get your own time for, I don't know, the yoga shala, whatever, doing things alone and all these things. They just, to me, it it's, was all about splitting families and shutting off real emotion and getting things in some systematic controlled order, which to me doesn't look like life flow. So I, 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 I just decided I would write my blog as at that point, at least we didn't have a lot of it in Europe. I could find something in the States, but it's, it's, it looks the same, but it's not the same Europe. And mm-hmm. so I thought we need, we need voices over here. So I just wrote my blog and shut off from everything else, to be honest. <laughs> and did you get a lot of pushback from that blog? Uh, well, I don't know, because I didn't read it. I read the pushback. I, I, did, yeah. I did get anyway, some hate, yeah. but I, I, I just decided to yeah, never look at it. I, well, I will tell you, when I came out with Radical Homemakers, um, it was probably the worst year of my life. It was, I would say, I mean, I've written a number of books. I've been writing 
my, my whole life writing and publishing. Mm -hmm. And theoretically that was the most successful one. <laughs> it was the worst year of yeah. my life because, um, it just felt like, uh, if, you know, every direction there was someone who was angry and um, it didn't matter. I, it was accused of being overly feminist, of being anti-feminist, of pro-education, anti-education, pro-religion, anti-religion, um, pro-overly government, anti-government, um, pretty much everything. <laughs> Did anyone actually I, read the book or... Um, I think I, I don't know if anyone read the book, to be honest, it sold a lot of copies. And then, and then I was, I started to get the impression that people maybe read the introduction, and then they got their ideas. And I don't know if they ever read the whole thing. Um, but I decided, well, if it, if that many people hated it, and bought it, it had to be a balanced work, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, but yeah, but good. but then um the other issue that I had with it and I think this ties into your reaction to the programming side of things was I had just as hard of a time with the people who worshiped it because I felt like personally as a writer um I, what I wrote was at a point in time and it was researched based on a point in time and where I was at in my life. And um, some people would read it and they would get these ideas about me that I could never live up to. I mean, mm -hmm. just, and, and the pressure of, of that, of trying to be what people thought you were to be this vision or this leader or this whatever. And, um, and it really came back to the same thing that I think women in particular have suffered for eons is living up to other people's ideas of what you were supposed to be. And I mm. found that no matter what, no matter what platform I stood on, no matter what opinion I had, I was always disappointing somebody. And even if they liked my work, well, then I couldn't live up to whatever they thought of me anyhow. And it was, um, it was a really difficult painful year until I learned to delete emails. And then I eventually learned to just not do social media. And I do my blog and I have my people who subscribe to my newsletter and I communicate with readers directly. But um, it is interesting though, how we come up with these ideas and you were very smart not to follow it. Um, to make the book succeed, I, I stayed with it for a while, but it, it was pretty painful. I yeah. got you. Uh, yeah. Well, had I written a book, I would probably have followed through. I was just writing a blog. It was <laughs> different. I mean, I was just sharing a perspective that was not shared a lot in my country. It's a very small country. It's a very small language. We're only, what, six five, million. six million people yeah. speaking the language. And in my language, there was hardly anything from this so-called exactly. other perspective. Yeah. And some most Lots of Danes prefer to read Danish. We all speak English, but it just feels more like home. Yeah, so I think my voice was needed in yeah. our language at that time. But I didn't write a book. No, no. But and you, you have met this uh, emotion from other people, I presume, where they took our choice of the way we lived as an attack on their values. That is, and it's like, come on, that is chill. precisely right. If you are walking your own path, um, and, and, and Jasper, I think you hit the nail on the head. If you're walking your own path, then people interpret that as judgment on theirs. Yeah. And, um, and what's interesting about that is I think, um, I, honestly, I've seen people do great things on all different kinds of paths. And at 48 years old, I just have no energy to judge. I have lots of energy to be opinionated. I don't really have the energy to judge. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> but um, that's usually an indication, though, um, what I started to learn, a couple things. I started to learn that that need, those people who felt attacked were suffering because they actually weren't at peace with their own decisions. Mm -hmm. And, and, um, there's nothing that I could do about that except leave them with their harsh emotions. I, I've learned that when they have that, you know, they might need to sit with that for a few years 
to make a change. Um, but I do think that there's a price. If you walk your path, then you are assaulting others just by your choice to not embrace what is considered a universal truth. Yeah. Like, for example, the, the, the need for money or how money should be needed. We, we see it as you're a homemaker. We see it when we travel. A big difference in um, in how people have a small uh, produce in their backyard. There are some countries in Denmark, all is grass and flowers and very neat. And then we were worried in... Uh, except when it's rain and mud. <laughs> except when it's <laughs> rain and mud and gray. But then we have seen in Portugal and um, in, in, in... Here? Here. We're in South... Yeah, East where the Sicily. where the front yard is just like produce, 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 and it comes from poverty, but then not. It comes from the reality. It comes from reality where you produce your own food, and just mm -hmm. have continued to do it. And I, I can be afraid that it's will it be lost some uh, sometimes. I know there's a movement moving it forward, but I I, I can't be afraid. Um, with everybody think they need to go to college, university and stuff that they don't know how to grow a carrot. Uh, they maybe never seen a carrot, you know. Um, so what is what funny. A, I yeah. think from from my where I sit in the United States, I think, oh, you guys, you have it together. We don't. <laughs> <laughs> because because I feel like, <clears throat> well, in Europe, people have known hunger. And in this country, there's been such abundance that people haven't wrapped their heads around that yet. And so it's just so easy to take the agricultural land and to take the, the vocation of farmer and disparage it and not pursue it um, because uh, people haven't recognized the necessity. Um, we have taken periods of time where we've lived in Europe with our kids as part of our own homeschooling adventure. and. Um, I was dazzled by the amount of little, um, we lived in this little rural French village where all the houses were close together. So they didn't really have yards per se, maybe just a little patio space outside for, for some chairs and that was it. But they all had um, along the river um, in, in an area that would have flooded, they all had their own plots for gardens that they were yeah. entitled to that came with the deed of their property. Mm -hmm. And I was just enamored with that. Like what a smart thing to do. You know, we, we probably would have slapped houses right up to that river. So when it flooded, <laughs> would have gotten hit and we wouldn't have seen the food value of, you know, when it's a garden, it can go under the ground and, and you can restore that. And, um, um, so I, I always felt my perspective looking at Europe was that you were ahead of us. But then when I saw how the idea of radical homemakers was not embraced, I remember um, being brought over to Ireland, actually, and talking with uh, um, this Irish guy. who He was just a guard in a museum talking to him about what I did. And he goes, oh. Why would anyone do that? We're only just moving away from that hardship. Why would anyone want to do that? And and then I wondered, well, I just wonder, maybe the, the, the chronology is just so out of sync between the two. So you still have your food traditions, but you haven't um, embraced this idea that I've been able to do, I think a little bit easier here, which is turn around and say, yeah, I'm not doing a job. <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to raise my kids and, and work with the land. But I think in a way, I don't know, obviously, everything about the United States. I've never been. And uh, obviously, there will be a lot of things I get wrong. But here's what I think. At least in the Europe I know, which is mostly Western Europe, I know that more than Eastern Europe, not that I, we've never been, but we haven't been as much in Eastern Europe. There is still a tradition of growing food and yeah. there is a tradition not as radical as yours, but people have these little plots. It's it's not true. It's all nice gardens with tulips oh, because no. it's nice gardens with tulips and a greenhouse. That's right. It is. And and we have these. Um, oh, what would be the English word for a finger? 
like um, little yeah. plots yeah, where you go in, in, you go for the weekend so you have this very very small house which is nowadays called a tiny house but before it was just like a like a small place where you could stay for the weekend if you need it because you work the land because of the poverty and famine everybody had lived through in the beginning of the last century it was just so normal that if you live in the city, you live in an apartment, you have a little plot somewhere outside of the city. You go for the weekend and work the land. And, and this is very modern now. Lots of modern city people, they have this little thing. They can go out. It's less than an hour's journey, very often much less. You can go for the weekend and then maybe you use it recreational. You don't really grow anything except one tomato plant. But some people actually do now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They do. And they don't grow everything, but at least, you know, they get their hands dirty. And and I think this tradition, we see it in France. We see it in Portugal. There's a lot of it in Spain. We're now in Sicily. There are, there are lots of plants here, lots of little garden productions and people swapping, I think they don't produce everything for themselves but someone has a lot of oranges and another one's growing tomatoes and then you 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 know you share with your neighbors that's actually uh one of the keys to survival that i learned um when i was doing the research i started noticing there were homemakers and homesteaders and a lot of times the 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 homesteading idea was about self-sufficiency and you know i'm going to grow it all myself i'm going to make it all myself i'm going to do it all myself yeah and the thing that i started observing so with every family that i interviewed i spent a lot of hours with them getting to know them and part of the journey of the book there was was uncovering what i could write about but then there was the stuff that i didn't write about because what i saw was so painful i didn't want to violate the trust in those people so these parts of the stories did not make it into the book in the same way but they helped me like a negative space in a picture helps you to see the picture they helped me to see the picture and what I started to observe is that when they were fixated on self-sufficiency that they were going to be completely an island unto themselves and providing for all their needs then um, they were also prone to what I would call housewife syndrome. This is what Betty Friedan wrote about in The Feminine Mystique that really kicked off the second wave of feminism, where they said, you know, women who stayed home became, you know, they developed this sort of mania where they um, they would get depressed, they'd have anxiety, they couldn't think about things beyond, you know, little mundane details or fixating on their houses or obsessing over their kids. And, and she dubbed it housewife syndrome. And I started to feel like I was observing that same phenomenon in these people who were all about self-sufficiency. And um, something that you touched on earlier uh, was actually what I saw as a sign of success was a little bit of mess, Um, Mm -hmm. a little bit of chaos uh, that when I started to observe the people who didn't have it all organized, who had a little bit of a mess going on in the backyard because they had a lot of happy chaos around them. But also that was a sign too, that you typically see that they were engaging more in the community as a whole, and they weren't trying to do everything. They weren't trying to be self-sufficient and attain perfection. They were increasing their self-reliance and then relying on the broader community for meeting the rest of the, of the needs. And that was really critical for me on my own learning journey <clears throat> because, you know, I have, my family has all this acreage and we grow all this food. Um, and it was really hard for me grappling with the perfectionism, whether I was, I was going to be perfect no matter what, whether it was a career woman, I was going to achieve perfection or as a homemaker, I was going to achieve perfection, whatever. There was always the pressure, right? To be perfect. Mm-hmm. And I, <clears throat> seeing these families where I started to see, oh, wait a minute, when you have it all together, it kind of comes unraveled in little secret places. It just oozes out <laughs> in different places. Mm-hmm. Um, I started recognizing, okay, it's going to be okay for me to come into my family, my family's livelihood and not do everything. You know, I will do what I can. I will, uh, you know, 
I will excel in the areas where I'm particularly good. We realized, my husband and I, that we are just terrible gardeners, absolutely terrible gardeners. But uh, since we wrote the book, I was a great cook. I And then I learned I got very streamlined with my canning. And, you know, you can put me in any house. My daughter, she's um, working in New York City right now. And she called me because she's she's staying uh, with some friends and she opened up their fridge and she's like, okay, mom, I can find cinnamon and I can find coffee and, and leftover chicken. What can I make for dinner? <laughs> you know, and I'm very good at that at, at being resourceful in my, but my space is in the kitchen. That is where I really care. And that's where I can solve problems and, and deal with things. So I started to learn, okay, I don't have to be everything. And that has contributed to my happiness, but you know, a couple miles down the road is another farm that I work with who they just grow fabulous produce. They really do a great job. And on our farm, we do an excellent job growing really delicious meat. And there's just a lot of economic um, circulation that is happening between all of us that then creates a life. And it's still not illegal to share. No. Depending. <laughs> Depending where we come from, some things you can't actually just share. Yeah, yeah. what are you thinking? Well, about? some skills. Oh yeah, yeah. It's, it would be if I come so and work. You, you can't be a, like, a trained electrician and fix the electricity in your mother's house without giving her a bill and pay tax from the income. Yeah, the you need, can't do that. They, they the way they anyway, done it it's is not important. It's not. It's actually not interesting. What is interesting? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> no, I don't want to go there with the whole state thing. What is interesting is, so you are the radical homemaker and we are the world traveling, you know, unschooling family. And I think it's it's a very important thing to underline when you have these radical ideas and you do these ex more or less, ex I don't find you extreme and I don't find myself extreme, but I think a lot of people look at people like us and think we are very extreme. Um, so when we do these quote unquote extreme things, it's important that we <clears throat> acknowledge that, you know, I do me and you do you. And maybe we we can share our experiences and knowledge and we don't all have to do the same thing. I think we need a lot of different voices in the choir. And um we have been talking about doing something like what you do get a place and and make a home and not be self-sufficient but like produce our own food or some of it or but we realized we're just not we you would have to tie us to a tree i mean we can't sit still so growing things you would have to come back and water the plants like every day and and we just have to go so so yeah i'm happy you do it because i think somebody has to do it but we have to do it in another way i, I have a question um uh, shannon it, how many books are you up on now is it seven did i uh... i don't know no, okay. They're like My naughty question. children, you know? Like, I'm just nah, coming down. Yeah. But it's not about the amount, but it, it's where the nerdiness uh, comes from to to produce a book. It, it sounds like when you talk about it, that there is this subject that you want to get to know, and then it ends up in a book. How how Has it always been like that, or how did it happen? <clears throat> yeah. Um, so writing... Writing for me is a cycle of, of curiosity. Um, this is how I learn when I have to understand it enough that I can explain it to someone else using the written language. Um, then that's how I actually learn. And so writing is how I make sense. This is, you know, I'm sitting here. It's a beautiful winter day. I don't know if you can see how white and glary it is outside my windows. It's, it's all yeah. snow. <laughs> Um, and my life looks very peaceful, but um, in order for me to make this life work, it's three generations, three generations who work together. And then we're in a small community that we've all known each other for decades. And so none of that comes without dysfunction and, nope. and conflict. And um, 
and we're in a livelihood that is difficult. Uh, you know, I'm the the expenses always outweigh the income <laughs> on a farm. You know, and so the writing for me has been a way to to understand it, to make sense of it. It's a way for me to spiritually organize my thoughts and, and communicate with powers that are beyond myself, but also, so yeah, so, so that's how books happen. Um, I, I get obsessed with an idea and then I carry that with me and it it gets organized into a book because I just, I have to. And um, I've been quite fortunate in my career. I'm, I'm supported um, most of my books are self-published, actually, and I'm supported through patrons on my Patreon account who value the work um, because the ideas that I talk about, they're not going to make a bestseller list. And no. I've already told you I don't do social media, so I'm not going to become an influencer and you know sell a million books by uh, having a great TikTok. No, but you are an influencer, just not in the social media <laughs> style. So don't forget that. I mean, they it. can't eat the word. <laughs> you don't get to do that. <laughs> uh, but yeah, but writing is, is <clears throat> it's been a way for me to just keep my mind going. And it, it brings me back to a place of peace because otherwise I'd probably be pretty neurotic. <laughs> so what's next? What are you working on? What's puzzling you at the moment? Um, I'm working on on two projects right now, actually. Um, one project is I've been working on a novel for 10 years, probably oh. more than that now, but I stopped counting at 10. And <laughs> um, I enjoy that. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> something in my throat. Um, I enjoy that process of just accepting perpetual imperfection and going back in and working on it. So um, I run a family, my family has a cafe that we run. I don't know if you know the story of that, but in the winter time, we shut it down and I take the winter off. And for the month of January, it's all bookkeeping for the farm business. That's just the nuts and bolts of it. And then for February and March, I'll work on that book. But there's another project that I am working on that I have not even talked about publicly, which is um, spending um, while the cafe is closed. Uh, so it's all the cafe, by the way, only runs one day a week. We only open on Saturdays. We Perfect. decided that um, I don't want to work more than that. And uh, it lets everybody because we really fun- use it as a community space. Then everybody knows they're going to see someone they know if it's only one day that we're open. <laughs> Yeah. Um, but right now, Saturdays were closed. And so I use that time to sit down with my mother and father who have been on this land since 1979. And my father's been raising sheep since he was three. And <clears throat> because, as I told you before, we don't all do everything. I have different strengths on the farm. I'm I'm the person who's sort of at the front of the business. I do the bookkeeping. I do the marketing. I run the cafe. But my dad runs the livestock. And um we have all managed to get along as three generations by letting everybody have their own expertise area. And so when we get mad, we all retreat to our own corners of expertise and stay out of the other person's way. Mm -hmm. But that does create a problem because I don't think like him and I never will, but I need to understand how we rotate the pastures. I need to understand when we're bringing sheep down and running them through the chute and we do a health check, what are the different ways? So um, I've just decided, um, like you, I, we went through a cancer event in our family this year um, with my husband. And I did came to two conclusions. One, I was going back to playing a baritone saxophone in a jazz band because I cared about that. <laughs> <laughs> and then the other one is I, I want to make my father tell me everything. And so that project is every weekend I go there and I sit down and we talk and I can only take it for about an hour because it's so intense. (laughs) He has so much to tell me. And um, so, (laughs) yep. So I do the interview and then I bring it back and Bob transcribes it so that the information is traveling through everybody. And then I will uh, take that and put that into a book. I don't think I'll put it out for public 
consumption, you know, but it's sort of a book for the kids on how we run the farm and how we make our decisions and, um, and organize it. So I have had the great joy as a writer to be able to choose the projects that matter to me and not the projects that are going to sell. But this one, this one really matters. It's a very important one. It's a beautiful one. Yeah, I wish I'd done it. I thought about it with both my mother and grandmother, but they they, they both went early. too early. Yeah. 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 Yeah, they do that. Yeah. Darn parents. Yeah. Well, um, I am thoroughly enjoying myself, but my brain, my brain is ready to explode afterwards because I'm asking my brain to work in a way that I haven't. My father and I are very, very different because he has spent his whole life um, raising livestock and I spent my whole life recognizing the importance of that, but I work on a clock. I say, okay, if I'm going to get a book done, then I get up at three in the morning. I have this time for writing books. I have this time for cooking. I have this time for running the cafe. I have this time for doing the farm bookkeeping. I have this time for schooling my children. I have all this and I work everything that way. And my father, he drives me crazy. He goes out every day and he'll stand there and look at the sheep. Yeah. <laughs> and he will stand there and he will decide if one's limping or if one has a strange gait or if if the room in on one is sunken in a little bit. And he'll say, OK, well, we have to change the feeding rations or we got to go catch that one. I'm like, I don't have time to go catch that one. I don't no, have no, time no. to sit there and look at the sheep. I'm, you know, I've got my own little little hyperactive life that I'm living. and um, and it's fascinating. And, and I want to pretend that he's calmly looking at the sheep, but the worst part of it is he's not quietly looking at his sheep. He's not a shepherd contemplating his flock. He's a shepherd who's spinning. His wheels are spinning the whole time while he's figuring out, you know, how much percent protein is in their feed ration. If they're getting the grass at this time and, and, you know, what percent of total digestible nutrition are they getting and, and what parasites might be coming in and how is that interacting with what the pastors are doing? And he's, it's like, it's like, you know, trying to get inside the mind of a genius while he's just sitting there quietly looking at his sheep. So yeah. <laughs> it's it's a challenge. It's a real challenge. Yeah. But we're Sounds both like an interesting one though. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um your last book, uh, Redefining Rich. Um what what made you write that one then? Um what made me write that one was in um in 2000, between 2015 and 2016, we were recognizing that we had to go through a farm transition, that my parents either had to sell and retire, or I really had to officially step in. And we were trying to figure out how to expand the farm to um, get some extra labor. And um, the price of farmland was going up so high, and our income as farmers couldn't sustain it. We couldn't oh. keep buying. So in our community was this little broken down building. It was a white elephant. Do you know what it means when I say white elephant? No. Uh, it was an, an awkward building that no one wanted to buy. It mm. had used, it used to how it was our firehouse. It still had the post office. It had a couple of apartment buildings in it. And um, they had tried to close our post office. The government had tried to shut down our post office and we had fought and led the charge to keep it. But now the building was for sale. We didn't want to lose it. And when we couldn't afford farmland, Bob and I realized that we could buy this white elephant building for much less. And we built a farm transition plan by moving the farm center of uh, commerce into the hamlet of the community to create more community engagement. And so we started this enterprise and then um, my mom underwent major heart surgery and my parents really needed me to then step in and take over. So we had this building, we started this cafe, I had to step in and take over. And um, I had to figure out how to make a business work and what I was doing as the, um, you know, I have a dog that looks just like that, I have to tell you, uh, and yes, I want to go get her and dog. put her in front of it. <laughs> um, but this I had to, problem. we can't really tell no, her to no. go away because she's so young, she doesn't really get it. You know, they, these homeschooled kids, they just, they have their way with you. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but anyhow, <laughs> uh, we had to figure out, uh, how to make it work. And I had to do it without, uh, at that time, what you're taught about when you go into farming or when you become an entrepreneur. And at that point I had become both. 
a farmer and I was running a cafe, a small business in the community. We're told that the honorable way is one of hard work, like so hard that you will drop dead working in both ways. Mm -hmm. And as I came into my own and I was the one writing the checks and deciding the business decisions, I realized that just like the pressure on me coming out of grad school was to have a career, now the pressure on me was to work myself to death. And um, I didn't wanna do that. And, but, but not only did I not wanna do that, but first I had to come to terms and acknowledge that because I realized there was shame tied to my unwillingness to work myself to death. Mm -hmm. And so, and so one, I had to get over the shame. Two, I had to then figure out how to make the economics work. <laughs> Oh yeah. <laughs> How do you run a cafe that's open only one day a week? How do you do yeah. that? <laughs> mm-hmm. um, and so uh, redefining rich became how I worked through my journey again on how do you make the finances work if you if you really don't want to have a full-time job. And I really just wanted to devote my life, one, to enjoying it, and two, to bringing the fullest expression of myself to make a better world. And Um, And that doesn't always happen. You don't always get a paycheck for that. So redefining rich was, well, I had worked out some strategies along the way on how to do this and how to make it so that I could still take my winters off and go sit in the woods to drink my coffee and have time for cocktails at the end of the day and travel if I want to travel. And so um, that book helped me to really gel those ideas and explain them. By again, by having to explain, I had to make certain of them myself. Absolutely, it, it's fun what you say about the the shame. I last year, uh, around this uh, ten days ago, last year, I said goodbye to uh, a fancy job uh, in the a CEO uh, for an NGO, and it, I thought it was the dream uh, job for me, you know. Uh, but I was so stressed out and I wasn't happy. And I remember standing in the shower crying and I was like, I don't want to do this anymore. And the fun thing is I've been the one while Cecilia stayed at home that have taken in. I've been the breadwinner of the family where, when she stayed home with the kids. And for me, this last year, at least you've been the money winner, money winner, not we the breadwinner. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. The money. It's not what I, I, I agree. But let, let me, there's two different points. Well, my my point, yeah, 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 absolutely. Absolutely. The, yeah. Yeah. My, yeah. My point is uh, this last year have been a wild personal ride for me uh, because I've been in an office for 22 years. The last five years we traveled, I've been working. Uh, and it's first this last year I've kind of, uh, released the idea of you need to sit in front of the computer eight hours a day to be someone. And that's the the crazy feeling for me is that I, I had like a loss of personality. Um, it's a, maybe to, I didn't lose my personality, but the, but the identity I have built Your up about being, identity. yeah, my self identity took a, a blow and I needed to work through that. And it just shows me that we are driven to believe this path is the right path for so many of us. And I, I'm very happy to be where we are today. And I'm just thinking so many people out there first get to ask themselves who they are when they are going on pension, maybe, you know, and then they're yeah. becoming a pensionist. Um, and, you know, yeah, that's a, it's a, that's a gripping issue. Um, If you are taking this path, you don't get to walk into the room and be the CEO. You don't get to walk in the room and be the famous. Mm -hmm. You don't get to walk in the room and have any labels other than your name. If you choose to accept that. And (laughs) um, that's, uh, I understand that struggle. Um, I think I've, I have been up against it so I walked away so young I was 22 when I when I walked and so I've gotten very comfortable not having anything tied to who I am but unlike you I am known by my mother 
I am known by my father, by my husband, by my children, by my neighbors. So I think in some ways that gives me more security than you might have, because even though I don't have a title, I am a collection of my relationships. I am an amalgam. There is always someone who knows me by this way. So as I move through my life and my community, I'm Shannon of Sapbush Hollow, of Jim and Adele's daughter, you know, Bob's wife, Sersha and Ula's mother, because I'm in this place where people have lived for generations. And sometimes I think that makes my journey easier um, because I still somehow have an identity and maybe it's its own challenge because you could also sit here and argue with me if we had enough to drink where you could say, yes, but do you even know who you are or are you who your family has decided for you? Um, but yeah. in many ways, um, I, I recognize all the time how the comfort I have when I walked away from any kind of career thing, um, people still knew who I was. People still knew my name. And to be honest, probably we are who we are in relation to those who matter. Could be, if we believe in a God, we are who we are in relation to our God and, and we are who we are in relation to our loved ones, those who are close to us and those who really see us. For you, it's... A, it's at least part of it is your community, people just around you who's always been. I think for us, one thing that we experience, if we're not, I'm not going to talk about the spiritual element right now. So people on this planet, human beings, we unfold, I think, our identity and feel that we can feel who we are when we meet people. Could be people we already know as we, we're nomads, so we move around which means our local group of friends change all the time. But we also come back to places and then we are re-seen by the same people like a year later or three months later or whatever. Yeah. And I think a personality very often, maybe it is something in and of itself, but it unfolds in these relations and people who work a career, I walked away from one as well many years ago, but you did only a year ago. Yeah. They have this picture of themselves seen by the colleagues. Absolutely. And, and you know, now you have to unplug that whole idea because you're not working a career anymore. But I, then you have to be who you are with me. Absolutely. And I just learned to knit. <laughs> well, good for you. Yeah. Good for you. <laughs> Redefining. Redefining. Why are you making fun of it? No, I'm not making fun of it. Yeah. Uh, it's okay. Bob yeah. has tried no. to knit several times. Actually, um, early on, I bought him um, knitting needles for Christmas one year and a book on how to knit because I, I never thought that I myself could do something like that. And he just was all tangle of string. It was just this wicked tang. We were living in this rural village in France and he was just totally knotted up all over the place. Wow. And um, and I sat down and I said, let me see if I can help you. And I picked up the book and I put it in front. I got the string all off of him and wound it up into a ball. And I didn't go to bed that night. No. <laughs> I be was the one who became a knitter. <clears throat> Um, it's a great thing to do, especially but actually if you now that you are knitting. We're we're five knitters, six, six oh. counting the one in Copenhagen. We all knit and crochet. Yeah, it's very nerdy, but we're having fun <laughs> with it. Two sons to knit, and now I have a husband to knit. My um, my daughters, uh, um, living where we are, as rural as we are, they do fashion design. Yeah, why not? <laughs> and um, it's it's unbelievable what they do. Um, my 15 year old, she had a boyfriend this fall who he went, he goes to public school and he asked her if she wanted to go to the homecoming dance with him. And she said, OK, and, but he asked her two weeks before the dance. And she says, well, I have to decide what to wear, which meant she had to decide how to design a gown and yeah. <laughs> 
all over. Because yeah. she couldn't just wear something off the rack. No, no, no. And so this girl, and it's very funny. They have their dress forms upstairs and they can't, they don't buy fabric. They, they, they go to the thrift stores and she found some old curtains and she, you know, she just pieced it together and she looks at the fabric and decides how the fabric wants to behave and she works with it and makes a design and, and executes a dress. And they're, they're both do this all the time. Me, I, I get, I wear the same thing every single day until it smells so bad that <laughs> I could care less about my clothes, but they're really into this. And then we have this family cafe where they work the front. And they always have these crazy outfits every oh, Saturday. They come in some days, my daughter, she's 19. She'll come in with a steampunk Renaissance gown on. And my younger daughter, she, you know, makes these dresses. Sometimes the night before she sews these different dresses and she roller skates to wait on the tables, but they all have their own expression. We're talking about identity and who are we? And yeah. they, they just, live their lives you know it does not buy they have no rules about how they're supposed to live they've decided that if we have this cafe in the middle of nowhere this is their opportunity to enjoy their fashion and they dress and they plan all week how they're going to do it and you never know what you're going to meet you could meet a punk rocker one day you could meet a a, a princess one day or a fairy another day and they Oh, we have another good reason to yeah, go to we the need States to, now. We need to find a way. <laughs> Sounds but wonderful. I have enjoyed um, sewing for me. I, I discovered in my homemaking journey that um, I tried a lot of things. I tried spinning, knitting, dyeing wool, sewing, um, all different skills. Um, and the only reason I actually tried sewing was because I was looking at my daughter's, my oldest was two. And I just used to see the way she would look at pictures and just really study what they were wearing. And I am so not a fashion person, but I had a gut feeling and I had $200 from my grandfather and I found a sewing machine that was a really good sewing machine on sale. And I bought it for myself, for her at the age of two and learned just enough as she grew to teach her and then gave her that machine happily. Um, I learned through everything that for me, I'm, I'm just a knitter. I, I don't like doing the other things. I get tired of it. And for them, they learned everything and they just love their sewing machines. They love their dress forms and to do the design work. Um, and I love that the life that we've chosen has empowered them to have these joys. I feel like so very often we spend, we invest our education in training people to work, but we don't train our, our young to celebrate and enjoy their lives and to tap into passions that are meaningful to them, not because they're going to make them money or because they're going to make them famous or because it's going to, you know, give them a job. They need to tap into the things that make them whole and happy. And I feel like this path has enabled that for my kids. Um, I feel like as much as, you know, when I see these other kids and I see a lot of the, the children their age, they're not children anymore, the young adults, they have suffered so much from this pandemic, um, from yeah. the pain that has come from whatever they were living through. But I also see that they've suffered. Part of the reason they've suffered is because they don't know what to do to make themselves happy. Oh, yes. Exactly. Exactly. That's what we talk about when, when we discuss our whole homeschooling, which is unschooling journey that I would almost say we don't care what they learn. They, you know, I don't care as long as they, well, I'm sure because they live this way, they do in ours in this radical moving around. We've lived, I don't know, maybe 20 places last year. The context is ever changing and they have to get up every morning and make themselves a meaningful and happy day for themselves and whoever is around, wherever we are. And they will learn to take that responsibility on themselves to make sure that life makes sense and that we we give what we have to give and we take what we need to to thrive or at least to go smiling through the day and that 
I can't speak English right now. That's okay. That um, it's not my language. I'm sorry. That, and I appreciate um, that you're doing it because I am definitely not speaking yours. <laughs> ability, ability, the ability, the ability to 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 make these decisions for yourself and evaluate them to handle it. If if you go to bed and you're actually not happy, um, you can't do that. You can't learn that if someone else is deciding all the time. And I think that's the great disadvantage. Um, and I think that's where they got so hurt, the young adults. We have children more or less the same age as yours, some of ours in that range. range. Yeah. yeah, I can't speak English, as I said. Um, um, they are hurt so bad, but basically from living the life that our children live all the time. So what's the problem? The problem is that they don't know how to handle making their own decisions or maybe they were not i don't know how it was handled in the states but at least here lots of kids were on their own or young adults were on their own but someone else was still deciding what they were supposed to do what they should have done but they had to sit and do it by themselves in front of a computer no one to talk to no one to tell them you know you're okay. And they were hurt. Really bad. Ooh, this yeah, is a bad. big yeah. other issue. I, but I, I think, know. I think the pain too also comes from um, this going back to Jasper's comment about identity. Um, I think they have been told what is success. It has been defined for them. Mm -hmm. And um, a lot of that has been stripped away now. Yeah. Um, I, I'm actually optimistic, though. My daughters, I, I can't believe how I've actually asked them to stop bringing their boyfriends home because it breaks my heart every time they break up with one of them because these kids are so wonderful. They are so wounded in so many ways, but yeah. you can see such deep, beautiful people within them that I think, I think what they have suffered in these last couple of years, just as the great depression in the United States shaped my grandparents' generation, this is going to shape them. And I think they might really, really be the generation that, that recognizes how am I going to be whole and happy because they are struggling with it in their twenties and in their teens. And um, I am hopeful. My daughters say, however, that they are just very, very good at jurying who comes through and who they decide to be friends with. <laughs> and that's just a matter of their good taste. But um, they make me hopeful for the future because I think a lot of these kids, um, because of this struggle, I think they're going to ask important things of this world. So I believe in them. The Let's serpent so. has been scratched. Let's hope so. Yeah. So they can see there's a, a place for them to, to look further. As you live on a farm, there is a, a job to do for you for the rest of the day there. So I think we should kind of round up now. Okay. Uh, what could be wonderful is if people would want to know more about you, uh, sure. if you can tell where should they go, where should they look? And well, if they are around, where should they go on Saturday? Okay. So the first thing is, since you probably have an international audience, um, they can find me online at theradicalhomemaker.net, theradicalhomemaker.net. And if you go there, we talked about redefining rich and those financial principles that I figured out that would align with our values. They can actually download a free workbook if they want to explore some of these ideas. Um, and that's at theradicalhomemaker.net. If you are stateside and you happen to be near upstate New York. It's just a couple of hours train from New York City. So uh, we are in the Northern Catskill Mountains and it's called Sapbush Cafe. And we are open every Saturday from April until um, just about the end of November from 9 a.m. until 2 p.m. But in addition to that, we also actually, our store that we have, our farm store, is open and unlocked. We have what's called an honor store that we put in the community. And so even if we're not open, you can still visit. People go in all the time and they they just write up their receipts. They buy what they want from the farm <laughs> and they go on. But it was a way that we figured out that the community 
Um, you build, you create trust by being trusting and yeah. it lets people get what they need at any time, even if we're not open all the time. Perfect. Perfect. We should find it on a like Google map thing and put in the show notes. Well, Shannon, it was really, really wonderful uh, talking with you. It was. Thank yeah. you so much, Jasper and Cecilia. Hello. I had a really good time. Good luck on your journeys. Thank you. Thank you. And likewise. Yeah, you let me know if you ever come across. We will. We'll and you tell me where in rural France did you live? Just as a final note. I'm so um, curious. I was in a very tiny village uh, between Tours and Poitiers called Saint Pierre de Millet. Okay. And um, so it's just outside the Loire Valley, like maybe an hour from the Loire Valley. I get, I get the area. I know where Tours is, at least. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. If we ever get to the states, we'll come visit. Yes, we, we need have to, do to that. wait for the vaccine thing to yeah. lift. It will come. But at oh, some we still have that requirement. We oh, can't yes. get in. Yeah, 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 yeah. We yeah. can't get in. Time, time will pass. But at some point, we can. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but <laughs> Shannon, wonderful talking to you. Thank you for your time. Yeah. Good luck have to you both. Bye bye. Okay. Thank you for listening. We hope you enjoyed today's episode, and if you like them, then please share it with all your friends and family. We would also love it if you gave our podcast a review. Thanks. And if you want to support our podcast and work, then you can find us on patreon.com slash the Conrad family. We will continue to travel full time. And if you want to tag along, then please follow us on Facebook and Instagram at the Conrad family. And you can also read more than 100 blog posts on our website, theconrad.family. Until next time, make a wonderful day. Thank you.